Have you ever not wanted a Miata? No? Oh. Right. This is the internet. My mistake. But let's just say theoretically you wanted to build some sort of project or you just wanted a fun weekend warrior car and you don't want a Miata because, well, they're everywhere and the internet will tell you Miata is always the answer. But here's the thing, I'm 6'5", no it is not. But I'm going to list to you 20 different options of fun cars that you can get from like $4 up to $19,999.99. Point nine like a gas station. We're gonna break this up into four different categories. First of all, $2,500, $5,000, $10,000, and $20,000, and discuss some different options of which you can get in all of these. And it's also worthwhile to note that by the time you get to the middle end of this list, it's kind of a hodgepodge of crappier versions of nicer cars and nicer versions of cars we talked about in the future. But here are just some options that you can keep in mind for these different price ranges. Let's get right into it with the $2,500 price range. And the thing is that since the pandemic and since the used car bubble, although things have calmed down a lot, Anymore, it's not so easy to find the $500, $1,000 car that used to exist fairly plentifully, but for under $2,500, you can still get something pretty decent. And the first option we're going to talk about is the venerable Mark IV VW Jetta. You could also look for a Mark IV Golf, and as far as engine options, there's several different options, pretty much any of them that were available, you can probably find under this price range. My first car, in fact, was a 2001 Volkswagen Jetta Wolfsburg Edition with the 1.8T and a 5-speed manual, and it was genuinely a lot of fun. And although I never modified mine, there is a huge VW scene and a ton of tuning support for the 1.8Ts, as well as like the 1.9 TDIs that you can find in the same year range of Volkswagen Jetta. And ultimately, the aftermarket is huge. I understand that it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, but if you're looking for something that is very practical and gets good fuel economy and has huge aftermarket support like a Miata but maybe you don't like a Miata or maybe you want something that you can drive in snow or use all year round in general use to carry your friends around check out a Mark IV Jetta or maybe our next option which is a EK or EG Honda Civic Yes, yes, I know, ricer body kits and fart can exhaust and kids revving the engines until all of the piston rods free themselves from the confine of the engine block, but honestly, there's a reason why Civics are so popular and especially popular with young people that put sketchy modifications on them, which is they're cheap and there is a ton of aftermarket support. There are a ton of real, uh, like really, really legit tuning companies that do stuff with Civics of any generation and ultimately, it's a really good choice if you want something that you can build into pretty much anything. There's tons of different swaps you can do and typically an EG or an EK Civic in decent condition can still fall under this price range pretty easily. Keep your eye out, you can find some pretty cool stuff for Civics. And the last option that I'd like to point out for under $2,500 is the venerable Ford Crown Victoria or the Mercury Oh my gosh, why am I forgetting what the Mercury one is called? The only thing I can think of is Marauder. How am I forgetting what it's called? The Alzheimer's from most Panther platform drivers is literally spreading to me. Okay, sorry. The point is a Panther platform car of basically any particular choice, whether it's a Crown Vic or a Lincoln Town Car or a Mercury, whatever it is that I can't think of right now. It's literally so obvious. How am I forgetting? Grand Marquis. Oh my gosh, there it is. Whew. Thought I was losing it for a second. But the fact of the matter is the Panther platform literally has also a ton of different aftermarket support and stuff like that and they are absolutely everywhere. And it is a great choice if you just want something that you can do burnouts in or slide around, something that's rock solid that'll take pretty much anything you throw at it. A Panther platform car of any sort is a absolutely great choice. Yes, Wade, this one is for you. Panther platforms are awesome cars. They've got rock solid engines of pretty much whatever generation you're going for. But for instance, the 4.62 valve, and that's an engine that has also a ton of performance potential and they are very, very reliable. They will not leave you on the side of the road. Unless they do, Wade, you might, Anyway, moving on. <laughs> the point is, Crown Vicks are awesome. You can do so much stupid stuff with them. If you just want a rear wheel drive platform that you can be an idiot with, 
this is probably one of the best choices you can make. Moving on to the $5,000 price range, we have a, a few different options from a few different places in different market segments. First and foremost, I want to talk about the F-Body Camaros, the 4th Gen Camaros and Firebirds. These are a rock solid choice for pretty much anything you want to do, but especially if you're looking into any form of straight line drag racing, this is probably the best place you can start on a budget. Um, whether you're getting the earlier F-Bodies with the um, LT1 engine or the later ones with the LS1 engine. Both of them are really good engines and they have a lot of potential, but especially if you can find one of those later ones for under $5,000, which is getting a little bit harder. That LS1, I don't have to tell you how good LS engines are. There's a reason they're swapped into literally everything. It's a great engine. It has a ton of performance potential. There are exceptions. Definitely do your research, but you can basically swap on a lot of stock LS parts from bigger displacement LSs and stuff like that that have better heads and whatnot, different intake manifolds or whatever along with those heads. And you can basically build a really powerful LS engine really, really easily. But moving on, another really, really great option is an SN95 or SN95 New Edge Mustang GT. Now really, a Mustang in general is a solid choice depending on what sort of potential you're looking for getting out of it. But a Mustang GT specifically of the SN95 era is also a really good choice. Neither one of them, the SN95s, the earlier ones, or the New Edge have quite as much straight line performance out of the box, or in my opinion, performance potential with the stock bottom end on the engines as um, like an F-Body with an LS1, but the engines that come in them are both really reliable and they both do still have a lot of performance potential, especially with the aid of forced induction. It's also a really, really solid point for an affordable drag car and the Mustangs like the Civics and the Jettas and the F-Bodies we've talked about before have basically endless aftermarket support so pretty much anything you want to build you can probably do it with an SN95 Mustang I know I've said that a lot already and you're probably gonna hear me say it a lot more in this video but that's what makes these such good project cars is that they have just so much potential you can do pretty much anything with them I know everyone's complained about the solid rear axle for years to come but first of all if you want to go drag racing that's a really solid place to start upgrade the lower control arms and you are in a really, really good place for straight line performance. And ultimately the solid rear axle is not as big of a deal as a lot of people make it out to be. There are certainly things you can do to make it a really good handling machine if you'd like to do that as well. But you might be thinking, well, what if I don't want a big old American boat car? Blah, blah, blah. I don't like water. Well, then why don't you buy a third gen MR2, also known as the MRS or MR2 Spider? These cars are honestly probably the most like the Miata of anything on this list as far as performance out of the box, but it's mid-engine. And I don't know if you know this about mid-engine, but it's cool. They're super, super balanced, and they, I think, are really nice-looking cars. Typically, they don't necessarily look exotic, but they look like a fun, sporty little car, and I've heard really great things about the driving experience. I've never driven one personally, but I think that that's a really solid choice. If you want something like a Miata, but you don't actually want a Miata, hey, the MR2 Spider is a really good choice. You can even get a weird semi-auto. It's like a, what is this hand? Don't look at that. You can get like a weird semi-auto, like automated manual transmission or something like that in them, which is a really interesting concept. So if that's something that you want to look for as well, you don't want to drive a manual transmission, that's something you can consider. And the last car that we're going to mention under $5,000 specifically is the early supercharged Mini Cooper S's. Now this car will especially apply to those who are Masochist? If you like paying a lot in maintenance for a car you didn't pay a lot for, this is a great choice. Okay, no, I'm kidding. Now, these are built by BMW. They, they have a lot of BMW parts in them, and they are not necessarily the cheapest cars to run for the price that you buy them for. Um, there are definitely problems to look out for. Um, so keep that in mind. Definitely do your research if you're considering buying one, but they are super super fun little cars They sound hilarious. Have you ever heard a supercharger? That's a good thing It sounds like if your power steering pump was going out aggressively, but it also made your car faster They're super lightweight little cars. They're just generally really fun cars to drive and again sort of in the same 
performance category as a Miata, probably a little quicker in a straight line than a Miata, and a generally practical little fuel efficient car as well. So if you want something that would be a fun, cheap daily driver, especially if you live in an urban area and you want something a little on the smaller side, a Mini Cooper S is a really great option. And not to say that if you wanna get some sort of weekend warrior that you can't have a ton of fun with the Mini Cooper S on a track or an autocross and stuff like that as well, just do your research on them. It could be a really solid choice for you. Now for $10,000, the first car, no surprise to anyone that I'm going to suggest that you can get is a Subaru WRX and even a ropier, probably not particularly great example of an STI, depending on the year range. STIs in this price range can be found, they can, they're not nearly as common as they used to be, and if you'd like to get an STI for anywhere around the $10,000 price range, I'd suggest you do it ASAP, because if Subaru does continue not making STIs in the future, or even if the next STI does end up being electric or hybrid like it sounds like it will be, I guarantee you that these older STIs are going to shoot up in value, especially if they're unmodified. Now, if you're buying an STI, it's also pretty likely that you might wanna get one to modify it. And do keep in mind that most of the STIs you find in this price range are probably going to be pretty high mileage and it's very possible that they might not have been maintained very well. So this is another car I would suggest you definitely do your research on before buying and make sure that you heavily inspect it before purchasing to make sure that you are buying a car that will continue to be reliable for the most part rather than a car that will instantly be a money pit. I promise you Subarus can really easily go either way. I own my 08 WRX for almost four years. I put about 53,000 miles on it, I believe. And when I sold it, it had 187,000 miles on it on I believe its original engine and it ran absolutely great. There was nothing about the way that the car ran that concerned me whatsoever. And as far as I know, the car is still on the road today. I haven't seen it for a little while, but I have seen it multiple times since I sold it. Still driving around, still seeming like it's doing good. So Subarus can be reliable, but you absolutely have to know how to maintain them. You have to do your own due diligence when it comes to research on how to maintain them. Now, if you do that, at WRX for $10,000, you can get a lot of the older WRXs that will be in pretty good shape for the most part. And even if you get an STI, especially if you budget for maybe doing an engine rebuild, because if you're getting an STI for $10,000, it probably will be a little hit or miss about how well the engine's gonna hold up. I'm just gonna be honest with you, okay? I love Subarus, but this is just kind of realistic. But generally, I don't know of hardly any cars that are just the best of every world so much as Subaru WRXs and STIs. My WRX was honestly the best car I have ever driven in winter. It is absolutely phenomenal. The car handled really, really good. It was super fun on twisty roads. Honestly, it's just a car that's great at everything. They're not particularly fuel efficient, so if you're concerned about that, the gas mileage is pretty bad. It wasn't really hardly any better than my Mustang with a five liter V8, but they're really good cars that do pretty much anything without complaining about it, as long as you maintain them well. So Subaru WRX or STI, good choice for under $10,000. And if you're willing to spend a little bit more on a nicer STI, you can be really happy with it for years to come, I am sure. Now the next option, you might've been thinking, well, what if I wanna get like the arch nemesis of a Subaru WRX for instance? Well, you can get, a, 2009 to 2015, I believe, Mitsubishi Lancer Rally Art. Now, when you think of the Lancer Rally Art, you might immediately think of the earlier Lancers with just like the goofy looking Need for Speed Underground 2 body kits on it that were still front wheel drive and embarrassingly slow. But no, during the Evo or I suppose Lancer 10 generation, Mitsubishi made an all wheel drive turbocharged version of the Lancer Rally Art, which was a really nice looking car for, for the most part. It looks like a slightly less aggressive Evo, which is exactly what it was. And although they did not make it with a manual like they did with the Evo, they did put the six speed SST dual clutch transmission in it, which is a great performance transmission even today, especially for its time. Now these transmissions are known to have a couple scary reliability issues. Most of them actually have fairly simple fixes. So again, I would recommend you doing your research on it before going for it. But if you do go for it, you will have, again, basically 
the WRX Lancer equivalent, which is a 238 horsepower car, I believe. They sound really, really nice, honestly. The engine is really, really similar to the one that is used in the 2.0 turbo Hyundai Genesis Coupe. They are just generally really fun cars. And honestly, it was a car that I considered getting for my first car. But honestly, I don't think you can really go wrong with a Lancer Rally Art if you want something that's fun, practical, four doors, all wheel drive, it's a great choice, just like a WRX. Another great choice for under $10,000 and possibly even under $5,000 if you don't mind getting a Tiptronic automatic transmission is the Porsche 986 Boxster. I know, fried egg headlights, but here's the thing. This car handles amazing. This is a fantastic driver's car. It's a flat six Porsche. It is super balanced. It sounds amazing. And here's the thing. I know the headlights are ugly, but just take a step back and look at the overall silhouette of this car. It's a really, really nice shape. It's a really pretty car. And again, if you just kind of want like a Mazda Miata amplified, a 986 Boxster is probably one of the best possible options you could make for any price point, but especially for under $10,000. You do have to pay for Porsche maintenance, which is absolutely going to be more expensive than paying for an NA Miata, but typically the 986 Boxsters are known to be pretty reliable. They have had the issues with the IMS bearing, which has scared a lot of people, but typically the cars that you're going to be buying nowadays have already covered probably over 100,000 miles. More than likely, the IMS bearing bearings in those cars are probably fine and are probably going to last the life of the engine that is in them. So I wouldn't be too scared about that ultimately, especially if you just want something that you're going to leave stock. A 986 Boxster is a fabulous choice for a drop top two seater convertible. I already said drop top, so I don't know why I added convertible sports car. Another option which I have a soft spot in my heart for and I would still like to own someday is the BMW E36 M3. Now I know, the, the E36 M3 market has changed over the, the, the years. I mean, it really has. For example, in 2017, before I bought my Nissan 350Z, I was going to buy a slightly body damaged E36 M3 sedan, but I didn't because literally everything practically at all that's well known that can go wrong with those cars was wrong with it. Like collapsed suspension, a general like body corrosion and rust in different areas, some issues with the clutch, just everything pretty much was wrong with the car. So I ended up walking away, but I almost bought that car for $2,500. And I would love to see someone find a car just like that today for $2,500. It's just not going to happen with an E36 M3. And the vast majority of them that are left are over $10,000, but you can, with a lot of hard work, <laughs> find them for under $10,000 in still decent condition. Now, you are going to have to be concerned about maintenance not necessarily around the engine because the S52 is actually a pretty bulletproof, rock solid engine, but around the body and suspension, there's a lot of things to look out for and a lot of issues that I would encourage you to do your research about. But if you really, really want an E36 M3, you have $10,000 and you're handy and you're willing to do repairs and stuff on your own, you can find them and it is a great driver's car for the price. Again, I would still love to own one someday. They are really, really cool cars, and it's a really great car that you can buy for $10,000, maybe. And if you're willing to spend closer to the upper end of the budget we're talking about in this video of $20,000, you can certainly find a very good condition E36 M3 for that price. So if you're willing to spend a little more, it might be worth it, but if you're not, well, you can probably find a sort of crappy example that you can put a little work into and make nice. But you might be thinking, what if I want a fun car that I can daily drive really easily but will always put a smile on my face for $10,000? Well, I have two options for you. The first of which is the Ford Fiesta ST. This is 
such a darling little car. There's a reason why so many auto journalists, when these came out, bought them afterward, because it's a very practical little car that gets great fuel economy, but generally has driving dynamics that rival a lot of cars that are purpose-built sports cars, and it's a little Ford Fiesta. That's awesome. The Fiesta ST is generally one of the best all-around cars you can buy in general for any price range, I would say. And it's another car that's definitely on my car bucket list I would like to own. I have thought about buying one as a daily driver in conjunction with my Mustang. I will probably go a different route than that, but ultimately, I don't think you can go wrong with a Fiesta ST. You can also find Focus STs for around the same price range if you want something a little bit faster and maybe with a little bit more tuning capability to it. But I think that the Fiesta ST is actually the more fun driver's car for the most part, especially if you're just planning on leaving it stock. Fiesta ST, fantastic little car. And another fantastic little car that has spanned many generations and you can find um, probably multiple different generations of this car for under $10,000 is the Honda Civic Si. But specifically the ones that I think of are like the 06 to probably like 2013-ish year range in this price range. What can I say? It has a K20. <laughs> I mean, it has a K20. It's a fantastic engine. There's a reason they get swapped into so many different things. It's basically LS swap part two in the car world, and it's a good motor. There's a very good reason why. They're super, super reliable. And let's not forget that the car around the engine is awesome. It has a great six-speed manual transmission, and it it's generally, again, like the Fiesta ST, a super, super fun, super practical car for whatever you want to do with it. With this one, I genuinely don't know what else to even add because it's just such a solid choice. And pretty much everything that I had talked about with the previous Civics for under $2,500 still applies with the, the newer Civic SIs uh, or the Civic SIs of those same year ranges if you could find them for under 10 grand, but I would be surprised. There's a reason they've continued making it for decades and it is just a great choice if you want something fun without losing practicality. Now, for $20,000, we are going to discuss these cars as quickly as possible because I am already spending way too much time on this video. I tried to ramble less than the last recording that I had of this video, which I totally lost all the audio to. But that has absolutely not been the case. So let's get right into it. The number one choice that I've mentioned for $120,000, kind of, <laughs> is Evo 8 through Evo 10s. Now it might be a little difficult to find an Evo 9 in this range because the Evo 9s are just typically more rare. They were only made for one year, but if you want basically for the most part the exact same car, for the most part, I know Mitsubishi fans, calm down. There are a few differences, but the Evo 8 is really, really similar. Now there aren't that many Evos in general in the United States. They're absolutely getting rarer, but again, you can find Evo 8s through Evo 10s for under $20,000, but I heavily suspect that will not be the case for that much longer. Because even I, not so many years ago, remember finding Evo 8s and stuff for like 12 grand. And now Evo 8s are like the same price as Evo 10s. It's, it's crazy. But I don't need to tell you about why the Evo is such an icon, why it's such a fantastic performance car. If you'd like an Evo, this is probably your last chance you were ever going to have to own one. So I would jump on it as soon as you possibly can because I heavily suspect the prices on these are not going to stay where they are for that much longer. And possibly the ultimate everyday vehicle for every occasion is the VW Golf R. You can find these of a few different generations for around this $20,000 range or under, especially if you're getting like a Mark VI or something like that. And what can I say? The Golf R is a great car. It's all wheel drive. The tuning capability is amazing. Go check out Mighty Car Mod's channel if you'd like to. Um, I believe it was a Mark VII GTI that Moog modified to like 600 horsepower and ate a bunch of supercars alive with. It just has something for everybody. They have a nice interior for a daily driver. They are all wheel drive for any weather condition. They 
have you know great performance potential, even stock. They're super fun to drive. They have a huge aftermarket. So if you want to build something that is an absolute animal, you can do that. Golf R, honestly, pretty much no matter what you want to do, if you want something that can do it all, it's a good option. But a more interesting option, in my opinion, is the BMW M235i. Because in a world where every single car seems to be getting bigger and bigger, especially in recent years, I mean, cars have just gotten massive in comparison to where they used to be. I swear it's like the 50s Mark II. It's like, if it gets any closer, every dad is gonna leave their family randomly one day for their assistant. But one example of this is the BMW 3 Series. The BMW 3 Series of recent years, being the, the G80, if I'm not mistaken, is literally the same size and I think even ever so slightly larger than the E39 M5 of the late 90s, early 2000s. It has literally gone up to five series size of only a few years ago, which was an entire sedan size up not so many years ago. And the interesting thing is that the BMW 2 Series, especially when it first launched in the United States uh, in 2014, is literally about the same size as an E46. BMW. And that makes it a really interesting proposition because in my opinion the M235i is kind of like a resurrected E46 M3. It comes as standard as a rear wheel drive, six speed manual two door coupe with a three liter inline six with a twin scroll. I almost said supercharger. I have no idea why. Turbocharger. It's a fairly lightweight car for the most part. It's certainly not incredibly lightweight, but it's not bad, especially in comparison to a lot of other modern day cars that compete in the same class as it. And it comes from the factory with over 300 horsepower. Obviously, it doesn't rev as high, it's not naturally aspirated, it doesn't have the individual throttle bodies of the E46 M3, but it will probably outperform it in basically every way. Is it going to be as analog? Probably not. But if you want a modern day equivalent, well, I say modern day, more modern day equivalent of an E46 M3, a BMW M235i is a really good choice. Or you can even jump up to the M240i with the B58 engine that is also found in the A90 Toyota Supra, for instance. But the M235i has the BMW N55 engine, which is a pretty solid power plant for the most part. They do have a couple known issues, not nearly as many as the N54, which it basically phased out. But again, just do your research on them. Most of them are easily solved and then they are a fairly reliable power plant afterward. But another thing that I think is really cool about them is that you can also get the ZF 8-speed HP Auto, which is probably one of the very best automatic transmissions to ever exist. The bottom line, it shifts incredibly fast, it's incredibly responsive, and it is super, super robust. And if you don't mind having that ZF8 speed instead of the six speed auto, you can also get all wheel drive with this, which is absolutely fantastic if you wanna have a car for all weather. And it's just so cool to have a sports coupe that's all wheel drive, that's just not that common, albeit it's probably getting more common nowadays with the electrification of a lot of different stuff, but it's just a really, really good option for somebody that wants a car for anything that is still a fun sports coupe. BMW M235i, it's a great option. And of course, everybody saw this coming, I'd like to talk about the S197 Mustang GT. Specifically, the Gen 1 Coyote, such as my own, which you can get from 2011, like my car, up to 2014. And I suspect that, although I have not actually checked this, so don't quote me on this, that the S550s are probably starting to dip down into the very low $20,000 range at this point, but you can really, really easily find a nice Gen 1 Coyote S197 for under $20,000. It's not hard. I bought mine for 16,000 and the car market has since dropped. So I'm sure that an equivalent car to mine you could probably find for like 14 if you look around hard enough. And this is a really fantastic performance bang for the buck. This is a 400 horsepower car stock, which is a lot of power no matter what anyone tells you about. 400 horsepower, that is a big chunk of power. And let us not forget that this is a car that has a ton 
of performance potential. Even naturally aspirated, just doing a few bolt-ons such as my car has can easily net you 400 horsepower or a little bit more at the wheels. And with forced induction, you can literally push like over 600, 650 horsepower at the wheels pretty dang easily with long tube headers. And with ethanol, I mean, you can push 700, 750 horsepower. And the engines are actually known to be pretty stout and pretty reliable even up to that level of power. Now the Gen 1 Coyotes are not quite as bulletproof as the Gen 2, 3, 4 Coyotes that have come out since, but it's still a great engine and is still the same engine platform, still has a lot of the same potential. And the car around it is not half bad either. I know that it's a solid rear axle, but genuinely, if you throw some coilovers on it and you throw some better lower control arms, maybe a better upper rear link, you can make this car genuinely handle very well. No, it's not going to be independent rear suspension, but unless you were on a very, very bumpy road or very bumpy racetrack, you probably are not going to notice much of a difference. And the chassis around the suspension is actually incredibly stiff as well. It's stiffer than a C7 Corvette. So if you want a car that you can build into pretty much anything, a Mustang of any generation, but for under $20,000, especially a Gen 1 Coyote car like this, is one of the best choices you can make. It will do whatever you want to do, and let's not forget Coyote noises. No. No. Coyote noises. And the second to last car I would like to talk about is the first generation Subaru BRZ86 FRS GT 780 2000, whatever different names they've given it. It's had so many. This is a car that I absolutely love and is probably the best equivalent to a Miata if you want something with just a little bit more power and also has a hard top. These cars have also been loved by many, many people, especially if you live in, a, in an area that has a tons of twists and turns and whatnot, this is an absolutely fantastic choice. Performance potential is out of this world. There's no other way to put it. You can do basically whatever you want with these cars. Now, they don't make a ton of power stock. They're only making 200 horsepower. It's true, that's not a lot, but that's not really the point of the car. If you're not really overly worried about straight line speed and you want something that will carve corners like you wouldn't believe, Throw some sticky tires on one of these babies and you will have an absolute blast. They're just so analog, they've got great steering feel, they have great shifter feel. It's a purpose-built enthusiast car. And if you'd like more power in a straight line, there are plenty of options for turbo and supercharger kits, of course, but at the cost of reliability and obviously that's a lot more money you have to chuck at the car. But these are really easily found for under $20,000 and in some cases I suspect possibly even under $10,000 if not now within the next couple of years for sure. An 86. How can you go wrong with that? And the last car I would like to talk about today is not at all like anything else on this list. Because <laughs> if you've been watching this video and you're like, okay, those all sound like decent cars, I suppose, but what if I wanted to build a jump in the desert and jump over all of those cars? I mean, what would I buy then? Well, you can buy yourself a first gen Ford F-150 Raptor, and you should do that actually. These are starting to be found under $20,000 and that makes me so happy because these are the stupidest freaking thing ever. I absolutely love it. For years, like performance off-road trucks were just such simple things. It was like, oh, it has a locking differential and it has all-terrain tires and we put stickers on the bed. The F-150 Raptor is not just that. It has literally like dedicated borderline pre-runner suspension on it, which is awesome. Now that doesn't mean you can drive it like a purpose-built pre-runner. It's still a truck that's designed to go on the road, but you can genuinely take it out to the desert, get a little bit of air and just tear it up in a bone stock truck. And that is awesome. They look awesome. I think they absolutely hit it out of the park with the very first Ford Raptor. I think they've all looked great, but the first one, it just, oh, it looks so mean. It just really would like to eat your children, but 
it will let them ride in the back seat, I guess, if it can just terrify them by doing very performance-oriented things instead. I mean, it's a Raptor, man. What else am I supposed to say? It's just a awesome performance truck that can do so much stuff off-road, and they're being found for under $20,000 now, and it's very, very tempting because it's a raptor. Do you know what a raptor is? It's like a six foot chicken that can eat you. That's awesome. So there you go, there is 20 different options for under $20,000 that you can get if you would like to buy a fun car that is not a Miata. And I hope that each and every one of you guys has enjoyed this video. Not hating on Miatas, Miatas are sick. I don't fit in Miatas, like genuinely. Um, in ND Miatas, just like the height that I am, with like the height of my torso and stuff like that, I don't, I, I don't fit. I literally, I, if I close the roof, my head touches and pushes up into the roof no matter what I do, no matter where I put the seat. Like I'm not making that up. But if you did enjoy this video and you'd like to see more content of this sort, as well as more content on my personal car, my Ford Mustang GT, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if you really enjoyed this video in particular, please consider giving it a like, and I will see you guys all in the next one.